Hello there, I am Adam Schnell and I am the Artistic Director and CEO of Ballet Vero Beach. And we are either here for another installment of Insights or we are about to film for you SNL fans one of those Mike Myers Sprockets dance parties from way back when. Remember that? I just had an espresso because I'm here with our ballet master and principal dancer, the man, the myth, the hashtag Camilo A. Rodriguez. Uh, this could either go amazingly or it could go horribly wrong. So I advise you to stay tuned for this entire video and see what happens because you never know. Uh, Camilo, we were discussing where we should be looking because we don't usually do this all on one frame. So we're just going to stare at you all. It'll be more fun that way. Am I looking at the camera or at you? Wherever you want. Are you uh, looking at the camera or at me? I'm looking at myself. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Camilo, uh, let's start with some rapid fire questions. Where were you born? I was born in Mexico City. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico. When did you discover uh, formalized dance training? How old were you? Um, I was about to turn 16. It was modern dance and that led into ballet. Great. Uh, give me some career highlights, some of the places you danced. Uh, yeah, some of the places you danced. I danced um, with Ballet Grand Viva and Ballet Trocadero, and both are those. Those are both uh, touring companies, so I traveled many, many places, and I got to do a, a bunch of fun roles, but I also got to do the same roles over and over and um, working on the same thing. <laughs> He's making fun of me <laughs> I'm just smiling. It's, I, we got it's, to go. it's a skill to, you know, go and do it again and again and again and again and still find the joy in it. To be fair, I didn't ask that question, but be prepared for a lot of that. As we go through this video, I just asked for some of the places that he danced, so we're going to distill that answer into Ballet Trocadero and Ballet Grandiva. Um, oh, you didn't say why, you just said no, places. Nope, I did not. <laughs> uh, so let's talk, we could go on and on about your dance career, but we're really here to talk about um, program two which is symphonic dances on which I have a work, but nobody wants to hear me talk. So we're going to talk about choreography and you and your latest work. First, tell me, do you remember your first experience with choreography? Yes. That seemed hesitant. Would you like to tell us it what your was, first experience in choreography was? It was a duet that I choreographed with a friend of mine. And I made two sculptures that were part of a set. They were these wired, weird sculptures. And it was to uh, uh, one of the very famous Sati numbers. <laughs> I'm making a face because that sounds awful. I made, I made the sculptures and I choreographed. We had, we had like <laughs> little nude briefs and she had it like a nude leotard. And we were like, you know, on each other like this. Very <laughs> I cannot believe we're going to put this on the internet. <sighs> um, great. Uh, how uh, how far into your dance career? When when was that? Um, I was probably like professionally dancing maybe a year, and I was like in my twenty twenty about. So twenty years ago, yeah, yeah. or more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. Did you immediately enjoy choreography? Did you have any kind of response whatsoever to it? I did enjoy it because I think it's cool to like, um, I had already gone to a visual arts school seriously. So I had thought about like art as my career. Then I discovered dance and it was so amazing to be able to express myself in that, in such way. So choreography was like the next step of that, but I never planned it. It just sort of showed up. Okay. Um, and prior to me starting Ballet Vero Beach, how much like how much other experience in choreography did you have? So I did again a couple of little things here and there, and then I used to live in Virginia for a little bit and work for the Magnet School for the Arts in the dance Magnet. Magnet School for the yeah. Arts in the in the dance department. 
And uh, I had a commission for like a big work and it was scary, but it was fun because the principal dancers were like my um, friends and some of the faculty and then everybody, the body of the dance, the, all of the dancers were the students. So we were uh, doing a collaboration of professionals and students. And it was, you know, exciting and scary, but that was like the first serious work that I had to like really think about. and. And uh, am I recalling correctly that you showed me a video of that and I did not respond positively? No, that's a different one. Okay. That's my second one. <laughs> so your second work, <laughs> what was your second major work? My second major work was for, <laughs> ooh, I'm going to forget the name right now. Because it was a university. But the point is, is that you showed me a video of that very, very on early on in the Ballet Bureau Beach process. And I... Was not. I don't think we were in Ballet Bureau Beach process yet. Mm. So despite seeing that video and having a negative response to your choreography, I still commissioned you and continue to commission well, you. Well, you commissioned me because it was the first collaboration with the museum. And you were like, do you think you can do this? And I was like, I really want to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's when that first started. Yeah, so that, I mean, that takes us to... That was the first full season of Ballet Bureau Beach. I think the first time we ever uh, collaborated with the Bureau Beach Museum of Art. And um, sometimes we have to do things to just make things happen. And I, I knew very happy. I knew that Camilo had the potential to be a choreographer. Um, I would not have called him a choreographer at that time. However, uh, I did not have the time to commit to more than one third of the program. So Camilo was actually responsible for two separate pieces on that program. Um, and those of you who have been Ballet Bureau Beach fans for a while, that first Museum of Art program became um, a larger ballet that encompasses all three works in it uh, called Museum Pieces that has become a touchstone piece for Ballet Bureau Beach. Um, and in particular, Camilo's work in that uh, was quite exceptional got my wheels turning, despite the fact that one of the pieces he used some... Um, traditional eight, Japanese music. Yeah, I was going to say squeaky, crazy <laughs> Japanese <laughs> music. But it's 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 a lovely work. Not what I would have chosen, but it, it really is a lovely work and people enjoy it. So you started um, choreographing for Ballet Bureau Beach and you are now responsible for... I haven't done the math. I should have done my research before we had this conversation. At last count, it was at least a third of the company's repertoire. It might be more of that, more than that now. Can you talk about, first just talk about your process when approaching choreography? Well, I, from the beginning, felt more comfortable doing modern work because you could... You mean modern, like modern, modern dance, dance forms, not like of today. No, no, modern, modern dance. dance work because it just was not as rigid and you could uh, find more avenues, I you would say. But then the challenge that you gave me that was cool, it was like, okay, so now what, my first work was for the, was a prey. Mm, indeed, we missed one. We're not gonna go back. We're just gonna call its first <laughs> word with the museum collaboration. <laughs> stay tuned, stay tuned for a better version of this interview coming out never. Please continue about your choreographic process. But I really always wanted to uh, maybe choreograph. Uh, I always really wanted to maybe. Seriously. I wanted to choreograph also using the ballet vocabulary. And you've given me plenty of those chances. And uh, you've also been a really good editor and a really good uh, eye. And, you know guide guide person that doesn't say change this or don't do that but questions and makes me think about it and I think that that really has helped tailor my choreography to the point where it is today I enjoy it I mean I don't know that it's good or bad it's just I you asked me about my process. I asked you about your process. I was raising my hand, audience, because I was asking if anyone else realized that he wasn't answering my question. Your choreographic process, go. Um, <laughs> my process depends on whether you're asking for uh, whatever you want to choreograph commission or if you're giving me a specific commission. 
because if you give me the music, then my ideas are going to totally come from the music. But if it's a, oh, we need to do something of this such and such, then I begin looking for music that would work for something like that. So, so has that changed throughout your work either with BBB or even before that? Were you always either concept to music or music to concept or has that evolved? I think before I had been music to concept because it's like you hear this music and you as a dancer can envision steps and then beyond the steps can envision like something that those steps express. Um, But then it's been cool to have a concept and then have to find the music that would perfectly fit the concept. In terms of, okay, so you have music concept, it's married. Um, I get the question a lot, well, then what happens? Are you just in the studio with the dancers? And I know that it varies, but for you, ideally, what is what is your next step when you've arrived at music concept? Well, then I do a lot of research, and I go in a lot of rabbit holes. And then I find myself thinking about things that have nothing to do with the choreography that I'm about to do. And I wonder, should I change my concept completely? And then at some point I get back to where I was, but now I have all this uh, information floating about. And I feel like that information helps me um, keep inspired and keep the the wheels turning. The one thing that I uh, remember when uh, we did Ritornello, and that was like the first bigger work that I did, is that I started to go with like, no, it's not just like a whim and an inspiration. I don't want to do that yet. Or whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do it because it's going to take me to another place that I know about. Or So while that means nothing to you and it's very abstract, my point is that now I am more comfortable in, in going, wait a minute, I gave out all this choreography and gave out it's like sometimes I'm coming up with it and there's no dancer doing it but then I can retract and be like that's already taking me in an avenue that I don't want to go as a big concept so as a review concept music or music concept then crazy when do you get to actually thinking about steps uh does it so I guess my question is how do you really put together the steps that you want to see in your piece? Is that the next thing after you've done all your research? Uh, the, after the research, I sort of structure the music like, oh, in these three minutes, this, this many people, and here, I, usually you tell me you have a trio or you have two people or it's going to be a solo. And then I start structuring them. So there, now I've broken the score into sections without knowing what those steps are. And then inside those sections, I start to create steps. And then I, because of the nature of our company, I keep in mind beyond whatever artistic desire I have. Okay, I don't want to tire this dancer to that to the end, I'm not trying to kill this person. Regardless I'm, of I'm laughing because I just saw uh, very, very, I think the first time that his dancers for this new ballet ran the first section of his piece. And when we say that they were tired and almost dying, I, I left the studio and I went, maybe you should give them a more of a break. So it's funny that he's saying he thinks about that. I did think about mm, it. Okay, I go ahead. Pl- please it. continue thinking about not tiring and killing the dancers. And. Well, like, for instance, I've done a couple of works that are solos for myself. Well, you can, like, come out of the bat and, like, do, like, all Gran Allegro in the first minute, and then what do you do the rest of of the solo? Well, actually, so we're to the point where you're talking about coming up with steps, and we're almost to the point about working with dancers. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, because... I feel like there's more of a history in uh, the modern dance genre or the contemporary dance genre of people choreographing on themselves. You know, Martha Graham was famous for, you know, she was the interpreter of a lot of her major roles for the longest time, her own choreographed roles. Like, no one else did them. Um, Do you find... I can't choreograph on myself. I 
it's not a thing that I want to do. It's not a thing that I like doing. It's happened like this much in my career and I just, it's not something I do. Do you enjoy coming up with choreography for yourself? I do enjoy co coming up with choreography for myself. I think that the, uh, the negative of that is that then I limit myself to the things that I can do. And like sometimes when you have dancers that do different things that you can, then it's cool to explore those things. But at the same time, um, I think that then self-choreographing allows you to explore things that go beyond just the step. Right. And I think that that's one of the things that our audiences have really responded to, especially because uh, a lot of your body of work for the company is solos that you have choreographed for yourself, is uh, not educating our audiences, but allowing them to really take time to focus in on one dancer and one thought. Um, and it happens to be you and seeing that in a lot of different ways is, is uh, very powerful. In fact, um, we only recently last season started, I won't say giving away, but giving some of your solo work to our other dancers. Um, and that brought a whole new level. Uh, just a silly little question about choreographing on yourself because I'm curious because one of the reasons I never liked to do it is because I was constantly, even while performing, editing it in my head. How do you stop and say this is what it is or do you even and am I just not paying enough I attention to look at it? No, I do and and I think this is also earlier in the question about my process what like gave me a little bit of like more confidence in choreography and at some point that's what it is and it, it suffices and um, it's not because it's the only option that could go there but it's, it's a pretty good option and I feel that um, to me each each little work and each part of a dance, it's like um, from A takes you to B, takes you to C. And and even when it's out of order, there's still a development that's happening. And I feel like a party you taught me that, like, okay, here's your idea. Work for that idea before you're ready to like bring new ideas into it. And so I, when you're working with a, a single person, then you really create a lot of development. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think asking the question, what's different about working on other dancers? I think, I, I don't necessarily think that that's a, a worthy question for this they interview. They can read my mind. So that's a little bit difficult. Meanwhile, he yells at me when I'm choreographing <laughs> on him that I can't, that he can't read my mind. So. We'll see. We'll, part part three of this is going to be talking to the other dancers. We do this <laughs> weekly. We're not doing this weekly. This is never happening again. Um, but in working with working on other dancers, um, talk about. I guess talk about what you gravitate towards in the artists that you choreograph on. Like what inspires you? What excites you? Um, it depends. Sometimes it's like the person, their body and their facility, and sometimes it's like the quality that they naturally have. I love um, legs and turns and jumps, but at the same time, at the end, what I like is like a certain quality that... Um, some people have and, and you can always get out of people if if they're willing to to step outside their comfort zone a little bit. Um, I teach movement to non-dancers and so it's constantly uh, an ever-present exercise for me to get somebody to do something that while may seem simple or they think that I know how to do this, I'm challenging them to do it differently. And so that's exciting when even a dancer that doesn't have something that I would expect, then so how do I get there? And how do they get, the, how do we meet in the middle? And for them, I don't know if they enjoy it. <laughs> so the one word answer would have been an openness. That an would be openness. the quality that he looks for. <laughs> but I changed a little bit because in the beginning I used to like have the whole choreography laid out, planned out, and then sort of t-shirt on them. Uh, due to time or whatever. Now the last few commissions, especially the, the last two, 
I've had a very strong idea and even specific steps, but it was really about the process of, of dancers and myself working together. So, so stuff comes out of there. Let's talk about the new ballet. So the work is called Bizet Roma, and that is after the composer Georges Bizet, and it is his second symphony, the Roma Symphony. How long is it? Half an hour? 30, That's about half an hour, 35 mm -hmm. minutes. Um, what, I mean, obviously the program was called Symphonic Dances. I said, we're doing Pastoral Symphony, which is my work on the program. I need you to find a symphony that inspires you and choreograph to it. And it has to be about the same size cast as Pastoral Symphony. So I guess we all know how this came about. Like there were a lot of um, parameters that needed Which are to... wonderful actually. <laughs> Although I still was on a rabbit hole for like a month and a half looking for that score that would be the one I wanted to work with. So what inspired you about that, the score that you're using? Um, that it's very danceable. Is that a word in English? It is a word. It's super danceable. And I feel like sometimes I like to like the challenge of like, oh, this music is not danceable at all. Let's use it. And which, so this was the complete opposite. Which is interesting that you say that because oftentimes the scores that you choose are not anything that I would gravitate towards. I feel like this one is one that I would gravitate towards. But speaking of danceable or not danceable, um, one of the composers that we have worked with a lot, Paul Gay, uh, who you've done one work by yourself, I've done one work by myself, and then we've done one together. The work that Camilo used uh, for Divertissement Nostalgique, which is one of my favorite works of his for our company, Camilo's work, and also Paul's music, uh, Paul, when I said we were going to use it and I was giving it to Camille, he said, it's not danceable. There's no, there's no dancing to be had with this. And then he came and saw the show and he went, wow, I was wrong. It is danceable. Now, partly I had two dancers that are exquisite when I first created that. And, and I knew that they could really like pull the line or pull the moment to create this still movement inside of the quiet spaces of that score. So you chose the score, you went down the rabbit hole, the score was danceable. Um, what, are there themes? Is there a suggested story? What, what is, as the actors say, what is your motivation for this? So funny enough, this um, symphony was never performed uh, when Bisset was alive because he thought it was unfinished. He didn't like how all of the movements went together, or he didn't. He just they he just never conducted them together. And it was later on uh, somebody decided, huh? I think that we're gonna put put them together again and, and have them play as as a as a work. Um, uh, I don't. There's no theme specific to the dance, but there's four distinct sections and. Uh, each section, somebody else may be the leader, so to speak, um, and their moods. And it's like a little bit like a poem in which there are some suggested images and moods, but there's not a literal story. Would you like to key us in on some of the suggested images and moods, or do you want the audience no, to be no, surprised? I'd be happy to. <laughs> uh, the first section is like dark and like energy and... Um, the way that I love to move a little bit, that it's like taking a classical line and then putting it off balance or extending it a little bit more, or, um, creating tension, not because we're tensing our muscles, but because of the way that we're like moving, it's, it's causing, it creates tension. Um, and then the second section is like a, a fun, I call it like joy square, because it's just happiness two times, because it happens two times. Um, the third section... Wait, what happens two times? The sec the section, the music, the dancing, what happens two um, times? The music is, is literally divided okay. into the two equal parts. Got it. Square. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the third section is totally a, a departure from one and two, and it's like simpleness, and is simpleness a word? No. 
It's not not a word. It is. It's about it's like <laughs> like just taking away everything that I did in the first two sections. Um, it's uh, I'm using Amy Sanders and like Saunders. Sanders. That's not a, and that's also not her last name. Can you say her? Just keep going to talk about the, the, the third section and then we will introduce the dancers. The third section, um, <laughs> I was inspired by her and, and she has this quality that she could just stand still for seven minutes and it would be beautiful. She moves a little bit, so I'm not giving it away. I haven't seen that section. Maybe I'll edit that one before you all and see it. And then the last one in my mind is fireworks. It's like what you expect for a ballet coda to be like. Go and go and go some more and trumpets and it's over. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> nutshell. Uh, so... You know, I always watch this and I'm like, the time that I'll be in it, I'll be so professional and so good. <laughs> um, so you brought up Amy, uh, our two out of three of our friends from Converge Dance are joining us on this program. So Amy Sonder, Jordan Miller, our resident principal dancers, Catherine Epping and Anders Sutherland, and then also one of our great friends and um, one of our audience favorites, Daniel White from Dimensions, are making up uh, the cast for this program along with you because you dance in my ballet on the program. Um, can you give the audience any insight into the trials and tribulations of both being a choreographer and a dancer on the same program? Well, I finally listened to you and I'm not dancing in my piece no. along with the other dancers. That can be hard because I want to concentrate on what they're doing, but I also have to concentrate on what I'm doing. So that alone is hard. I'm so glad you said no. Um, I very much enjoy dancing. And so um, it's cool to, in one, like, want to encompass all the space and all of the, I want to know all their thoughts. I want to direct everything. And on the other one, I just, I'm going to let him do that. And I'm going to do whatever he says. <laughs> Nobody out there in um, virtual world believes that you let me do all the directing and you never say <laughs> or have a comment about anything. But I still do it, which is the point. So I, I enjoy, um, it's, it's like black and white. I enjoy being like, oh, it, it's all uh, the responsibilities on me. And like, oh, my responsibility is like, Enjoying the dance. Did that answer your question? Nope. But why, why, answer but, why, but why start now during this interview answering my question? You asked me how was the, how was it different? Um, I said trials and tribulations. Is there anything you have to do physically or mentally different when you're doing both things in one program? I know you do that a lot, but I think people would be curious to know. The, I mean... To me, really, the only like the hard thing is that when we get to the theater, at some point, I can't watch my dance anymore because I'm concentrated on preparing myself. So that I think that would be the the trial and tribulation that I miss the actual performance. I catch a little bit from the wings, but I'm really like <laughs> getting ready for my performance. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> So I think that I think that we've covered most anything. Um, what do you have a favorite piece so far? Don't say the one you're currently working on, but do you have a favorite piece so far that you've choreographed for no, Ballet Vera Beach? No, I really like like them all for different reasons. You know, I want to say, oh yeah, Afternoon in the Paddock is my favorite because I'm in it and I do love that piece, but I love the Swan and I love. Uh, the Ritornello was like such a cool departure and then the, the one that you were talking about earlier um, the museum pieces oh. and, the best, and then that one too I mean it's just so no is the answer no, he, he loves no. them all <laughs> I do I do I'm sorry I do uh, sometimes we go to see dance and there's all this stuff that you see the choreographer like trying to make some sort of cool point or trend point or new point and sometimes it's cool to just like I think a lot of my dance, I want to, I want to watch something that I, I want to create something that I would want to sit in the theater and watch. And that's, 
That's one of my big motivation, I guess. Well, that's funny, because I was going to ask you, what advice do you have for choreographers as they go about their journey? And I think I'm not even going to let you answer. I'm just going to tell all the choreographers out there, make a dance that you would want to sit in the theater and watch. I think, I mean, I, seriously. Even if... No. If that's all. <laughs> Make something that, you want to see. That was, a, that was a very nice point to end it on. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think we've about covered it. I think we should tell everyone out there that despite the comedy of this video, we are very excited for Program 2 coming, coming up in a couple weeks. And also... Uh, don't judge this insight video on whether you're oh, thinking about buying a ticket it. or perhaps giving us a donation to continue our work. No, no, this is just for fun, but do come to the theater and come see the performance. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a ticket, make a donation. Yeah, I mean, now that you've heard all about this, you've got to see what it comes out looking like when you come to the show. Uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you to hashtag everyone loves Camilo, mostly, uh, thank you, Adam. for being here. And um, we will see you guys in the theater in a couple weeks. Have a great day, evening, night, weekend, whenever you watch this.